All right, guys, so it's the final moment that everybody's been waiting for. The questions, the comments, all the concerns. It's the infamous inertia starter. All right, so this entire build, like we've told you guys before, was designed and constructed around this one particular piece, and it's actually the aviation inertia starter. Um, this thing is World War II era, you know, 40s, and it was made by a company called Eclipse Aviation. It's actually a division of uh, Bendix uh, Manufacturing Company, and they made these things for airplanes um, and a lot of other pieces of equipment back in the day. Um, this particular one actually is aviation though and I found it on eBay and I've actually had this idea in my head now for a couple years and never really had the opportunity to kind of incorporate it into a build or it, it didn't really fit what it was, with what I was currently building. So this was the first opportunity we had to actually put this into a bike and you know make something that you see here. So. The entire thing was designed around this inertia starter because we had to do it so it was aesthetically pleasing and obviously it looked like it was somewhat of a factory form function kind of deal. Um, and it, it, you know, it was definitely a challenge because you know, it's obviously designed for an airplane, it's not designed for a motorcycle. And two, it doesn't spin the correct way. So we had to add a ton of stuff in here to, to make it work to what we needed it to work too, which is obviously starting this 1948 Panhead engine. So when I started the research process to find the starter, it was you know ups and downs and trying to cross over into different things. And obviously we ended up with this particular brand, but it, it wasn't just a cut and dry, oh, go buy an inertia starter, let's put it on a motorcycle. So. I had to find something that obviously was small enough to fit the frame and look correct, you know, and the other thing was is actually finding one and finding one in operable condition. Um, usually this kind of stuff, if it's not on an airplane somewhere, in a junkyard somewhere, um, they, they don't usually just hang around in people's garages. It's not something you find every day. So I started down a long road doing research on inertia starters. Uh, I've seen them in different forms. I've seen them on old REO trucks from the 30s. I've seen Model A's had inertia starters. Obviously Tiger tanks, that's a lot of comments we get is Tiger tank inertia starters. And they're all different, you know, different sizes, brands, everything. And I've always been kind of infatuated with them. Just not just because of what they are, but the noise they make uh, and just the pure mechanical aspect of it, which is obviously what we were going with on this particular bike was the, you know, the aesthetics and the mechanics. So, uh, I wanted to make sure we found the perfect starter for this actual application. And I did a lot of research, looked at different websites, read a ton on forums, threads, stuff like that. A lot of it was aviation related. And I just started looking, you know, I just started searching. So I ended up finding this one on eBay. Um, I reached out to the gentleman that was selling the inertia starter. I asked him, you know, if he could supply me some dimensions because obviously pictures don't really show how big these things are. And it was a little bit bigger than I, what I was looking for, but I quickly realized that um, I could actually shed some weight off of it. Because a lot of these inertia starters actually had a electric portion to them as well. It wasn't just mechanical. So you could actually have a 24 volt motor, a 12 volt motor, which is one this one had, this particular model, and it would act as the actual, you know, it would go into the, into the flywheel portion on the other side, and it would actually help spin the starter up so you could start the plane with electronics. Um, and the, the crank was kind of like a manual backup. So this one had that 12 volt motor and that whole assembly on the, uh, I call it the bell housing, it's kind of like the face of the starter. And what I did was, is I took it, I cut it off, and then I put it in my mill and I milled it out and I, you know, cleaned it up so it looked more factory like and it actually shrunk it down quite a bit. We shedded a bunch of weight. Um, the starter without all that on there, it weighs roughly around 26, 27 pounds in that range. And it actually fit the frame really well. You know, once, once we had the frame made and we got the starter up there, 
it actually tucks in and it actually mounts like where the oil tank would actually be on this bike uh, if it was a factory style bike. So it actually looks like it belongs there, you know, it's kind of its home. And that all worked out really well. The other thing was, um, the challenging thing was all the math to make this work correctly, right? So we figured out the gear ratio on this particular model and it's around 128 rotations to, to one on the output. So what that means is the outside flywheel, the, the, the real loud noise that everybody's hearing when I'm cranking on this thing. That's, that's, the, the, that's the small flywheels that are spinning up to create the momentum to turn the lower gear output for the actual torque side to, to crank the motor over. And what that is, is that's that flywheel spinning 128 times to the one revolution that this one's coming out on this side. And, you know, we did that by marking it and doing an actual, just an RPM test, a simple RPM test on the bench. And obviously this starter doesn't have any kind of, um, you know, tachometer or anything to let you know what your speed is and there's no stop or anything on it. So it literally just spins as fast as you can make it spin. So there's no, uh, there's no gauge or anything to tell you, Hey, you need to stop spinning this. This is this, this is the speed you need to start this motor at, you know? So it's as hard or as slow or as fast as you want it to go. So that was a learning curve in itself because obviously the faster you spin this thing, the more torque output you're going to have to fire the bike. But that also creates other problems, right? Um, the more torque output you have, the more likelihood you have of breaking whatever it is you're outputting the torque to. So we had to try to build this entire gear system as robust as we could in the size and in the box that we could. So when we set out and started designing this entire setup, we realized very quickly as well that this thing wasn't spinning in the right direction. The starter would have been mounted over on this side to get the RP to have the output shaft spin at the correct direction that the motor needs to spin in to start the motor. Um, so that obviously added another challenge for us, right? We had to put a whole set of gears in here um, it, which Kevin designed when we were doing the CAD models of the bike. And we had to make it so that it actually reversed the, the output drive of the, of the gear. So what we had to do is add another gear, an output gear, and then another gear for the, for the sprocket you see here. And what that also allowed us to do was RPM. Because we were doing some math and trying to figure out when we originally were gonna build this bike, I wanted to run a Magneto system on it. And it ended up not working out because I didn't have the room to run a mag. There was no uh, location I can mount the Magneto. Um, that work with the exhaust setup that I wanted to run and uh, the space with the single loop frame in the front there where they usually go. So I ended up having to run a you know 12 volt cycle electric generator system which is fine. All that did was add a little uh, you know I had to put a battery in the bike which we hid underneath the gas tanks and uh, but what we did with the whole point of that story is we were, when we were doing the math to figure out what RPM the motor actually fires on when you're spinning the motor over to fire it, right? So a Magneto typically likes anywhere from 300 to 340 RPM in that range. Uh, obviously the faster you spin the motor over the better. Um, so Kevin got to work on doing some math. Uh, you know, we figured out what the output RPM was on a kicker because this bike also has a kicker. You can start this bike with a crank or kick. Um, and we tried to match that output RPM on this with the 96 RPM output on the inertia starter to fire the bike. So that's what we came up with with the gearing over here. Um, you know, and that's sort of roughly the speed I get it up to to fire the bike over. So once we got that all figured out, obviously it was getting to work on putting this together. So uh, that was another challenge in itself. You know, um, nothing, nothing of this nature exists. So it's all has to be made. So what we did is we uh, made the sprocket, um, like the other sprockets and everything on the bike. We made the sprocket that goes on the clutch basket here. Um, this sprocket goes over the clutch basket, like almost like a starter ring. That's kind of where I got the idea for that was, you know, hey, let's just make a sprocket instead of a starter ring. You slide it over the clutch basket. Um, you know, we laser cut it out and then I just welded it to the, uh, to the clutch basket outer shell here and that allowed us to put the chain drive on this side here. And we laser cut this sprocket, and this is cut to a certain tooth so that we keep our RPM that I just spoke about so that we could actually fire the motor at the correct RPM. And then all the gears behind that. And those had to be pretty beefy, right? Because 
uh, our output torque on this is in the range of two to 300 uh, foot pounds of torque. So we wanted to make sure that was beefy and it could handle that engagement every time it comes out. Because what happens is you take the seat, you pull a pin here, you flip the seat up. I have a crank handle right here that mounts in between the gas tanks. You go down, you unfold the crank handle, you spin the starter over, you get it up to uh, an RPM that I'm kind of guessing, obviously I don't know exactly. Uh, it's kind of by sound. The starter makes a, you know, a certain sound at a certain RPM. And there's a lever on the starter that I'll actually pull out and the spool comes out of the starter and into the spool that we had to reverse mirror. So this is a one-way spool and this is how it came uh, on the airplanes that it actually spun the flywheels over to start the engine. And what it is, is it's, I call it a one-way spool, a one-way cog, whatever you want to call it. Um, it comes out at, you know, at the rotation, which is backwards to what we need, but it comes out in a backwards rotation. And then our cog matches the exact face of that. It's just a mirrored image that we machined and had hardened. And it slips into it and it grabs it. And when it grabs it, it'll take our gears, it'll spin our gears, it spins a smaller gear in the correct direction that we need to go. And once the motor fires and actually takes over, it's running at a much faster RPM than what the starter is. So that one-way gear, that cog that comes out, it just automatically picks up and it pushes the, the cog from the starter out because it just slips in, it's like a ramp. And when it slips out, there's a spring in the inertia starter and it automatically retracts that back into the body of the starter itself. And then the motor just runs, right? So all these gears are spinning um, while that starter is kind of winding down. And after I start the bike with the inertia starter, there's so much extra momentum and torque built up in there. It usually spins for a little while after the bike is actually running. So you could actually see it winding down and you can hear the noise kind of calming down on there, which is kind of cool. And you know, there's obviously a ton of comments uh, about people saying the bike's not rideable, sprocket's too high, but I actually made a little leg guard right here. And uh, it, it, it allows you, you could rest your leg right on top of this without any kind of issues. And it's not really that hard to ride. Um, you know, I have a foot clutch right here. So the entire time you're riding the bike anyways, your foot's on this assembly right here and uh, your leg's up. And so my leg is, you know, pretty high in relation to the sprocket. Obviously, if you had an issue with the chain or the chain decides to come apart, um, it's going to hit the inside of the guard and it's going to fly around and fall off or who knows, it could hit you. It's obviously possible. Any open chain system has some kind of a risk to it. But let's face it, uh, you know, people have been running open chains um, since the beginning of custom culture. It's just what it is. Um, also, there's no chain tensioners here. Um, Panheads didn't have chain tensioners until the very end of the era. Uh, pan heads were always, you know, the chains, knuckleheads, and everything earlier than that was all adjusted by your transmission. So you can actually loosen the bolts on the transmission. There's a transmission adjuster nut, and you can slide the entire assembly back. And, you know, being brand new chain, every time you start this bike, it gets a little loose, slinks up, um, and you got to readjust it again. So every once in a while, you'll see in a video, this chain's hopping around. It's not that big of a deal. What I do is I just slightly adjust it up. And, you know, until it breaks in, it's going to keep getting loose as we run it. And for the inertia starter, we found out we needed to obviously add a chain adjustment to here. I didn't want to run any kind of tensioners on the outside to clog up the entire gear setup and add more complication right here. I wanted to keep this as clean and aesthetically pleasing as I could. So what we did is we actually slotted the uh, pillow block bearings in here on the gears that house the gear sets. And you can actually adjust them up and down. So once you get... Uh, everything on here where you want it, you just uh, slide your gear set up and you, you tighten it down and it keeps your proper adjustment on your chain here. And everything in here is riding on bearings. It's, uh, it's extremely safe. The gears are all very heavy duty. They're hardened. Um, we machined everything here in house. Um, you know, I cut the gears down, made all the custom spacers. There's locks on both sides of the shafts. It doesn't allow anything to fluctuate, move or anything like that. I saw a couple comments where people were saying, oh, your sprocket's loose, da da da. Well, it's not really loose. I know it looks like it could be in the photo or the video that you guys are watching. You know, obviously rotating assemblies make funky looking things on camera. I assure you, none of this stuff is loose. It can't come loose because it's all welded solid. Um, and actually, the reason it's welded solid is because the first time we went to go start this, I cranked it over, pulled the lever, 
and it had so much torque that we weren't expecting, it actually sheared the keyway inside on the gear set. So we found out very quickly, first start, that we had to go back to the drawing board. And that's all part of it, right? You gotta test and fail and you know try again. So once we got that figured out, I just went through, welded everything up solid. I TIG welded all the gear sets and everything at every mount point on here. So it can't strip, it can't spin, it can't come apart. Um, obviously if it comes apart, you got a, uh, an issue there, but you know, for the most part, this is no different than any other rotating assembly on a motorcycle. It's just up a little bit higher. The inertia starter works really well, as you guys can see from the videos. And um, I'm really glad you guys enjoy it. So we're gonna do a couple more videos for you guys on the bike, and it's actually gonna be on the ground. We're gonna show you, the, you know, while the bike's running, we're gonna go through the running process, the riding process, everything there, the starting process. But uh, you know, this is the in-depth look at the starter. And as always, if you guys have any questions, comments, or anything, please feel free, reach out, let us know what you're thinking, and uh, we'll get back to you. And if you guys could take a little time, hit that subscribe button, we really appreciate it, and sign up for our newsletter where we'll update you in on this build and all current builds. We have a lot of stuff coming up here in the future. I got a lot of bikes coming up on the platform here to, to build and put together. We have a ton of events, and uh, thanks for watching.